This is the engine that Ford used to replace the infamous flathead. And we're going in for a deep dive to see what it's all about. Ford's Y-Block engine first debuted in 1954, and it wasn't fully phased out in favor of the Windsor and the FE family of V8 engines until 1964. This particular engine is a 1955 292 block out of a classic Thunderbird. The owner had recently had the engine gone through, but it never did run right. So he brought it to Keith Dorton of Automotive Specialists to have it gone through and rebuilt correctly. Dorton found three cracked connecting rods, among other issues, fixed them, and already had the short block mostly assembled when we visited to check out the progress of this engine. Dorton says this is a mostly stock rebuild. The Thunderbird's owner uses this car more as a cruiser than a sports car, so this won't be a high horsepower build. Dorton, however, has built a Y-Block with fuel injection and over 300 horsepower that we once covered for Hot Rod Magazine. So we know he definitely knows his stuff when it comes to this engine. Still, the Y-Block is unique and pretty cool, even though it has a few faults that has to be overcome. But we'll get to that, and the solution is pretty cool. The bottom end of this engine is all stock. The crank and rods are all OEM components, and the block has been bored 40 thousandths of an inch over, so the silver light pistons we're using are now 4 inch 150 thousandths in diameter with a 5 64 cents ring package. These are true flat top pistons and don't even have valve pockets. You can't really see it because it's already assembled, but one of the things that makes the Y-Block unique versus almost any other cam and block engine is the lifters actually install from inside the block. They go in through the cam board and can't come out with the camshaft in place. They're like the ultimate mushroom lifters and they only come in solid flat tappet. The camshaft is a stock grind to keep that original Y-Block sound. So it's relatively small at 238 degrees of duration for the intake valves at 20 thousandths lift and 230 degrees on the exhaust. The lobe separation is 112 and a half degrees and the valve lift is a modest 373 thousandths of an inch. Up front, there's a pretty beefy timing chain and an eccentric lobe to run the fuel pump. Notice the fuel pump counterweight to keep everything balanced. And now we get to the part of the build that's definitely not stock. One of the big weaknesses of the Y-Block is that all oiling to the rocker arms goes through a hole in the center cam bearing and then through galleries that feed the rocker shaft with pressurized oil. Not exactly the best plan because it's hard for enough oil to get to all the rockers while also keeping enough oil around the cam bearing at the same time. So Dorton has developed his own system to feed clean pressurized oil to all the places it needs to be. Plus, he's even built in lifter squirters. This definitely helps durability, especially if you're making more than stock power levels. So what we've done, uh, if you want to look around to the back here, this is the main oil galley that oils for the whole system. This is the galley goes to the mains and then up to the cam bearings. But we've teed in here with a fitting. There'll be a hose that connects this bulkhead to get pressure straight from the main galley. And then we've got a, a log right here. This goes down and it oils the center cam bearing plus it oils the rock arms. So this will be the only oil going to the rock arms now because it's blocked off at the cam bearing. So we're getting all that oil to the cam bearing to eliminate that issue. This will be a constant supply of oil to the rock arms. So eliminate that issue. Now, this hose is feeding this steel log here that is drilled to spray oil on each lifter and cam load depth for wear there. We'd use a similar thing like this log for some of the NASCAR engines when we had to run flat tappets and to get a spray right directly onto the lifter and the load contact area. So we had some issues with um, uh, some wear 
even on the stock camshafts, but especially on the performance uh, cams on this Y block with uh, more lift and spring tension and so on. So I thought, well, you know, why not do the oiler? So even though this is a stock engine going in a 55 T-Bird that's being uh, uh, restored, uh, why not do it? It's not that much effort, and that way we're going to pretty much ensure long life for the cam lifters and rock arms. The front cover is the original cast piece, and it is a heavy beast. Notice that Dorton has already sprayed the red, and yes, that was the original Ford color for this engine, around the front cover. That's because once the combo front pulley and balancer is in place, this area will be hard to reach. There are no dowel pins to locate the front cover, so it's loosely bolted in place until the stock balancer and front pulley combo can be positioned to make sure that the cover, and really more importantly the front seal, is centered around the crank snout. Another sort of unique feature of the Y block is the oil pump is external to the block. The oil pickup is mounted inside the oil pan with a tube that runs to a bulkhead and extends out of the pan as you can see here. As you can probably guess, all this external plumbing can create annoying oil leaks if you aren't careful. But on the bright side, maybe it helps keep the oil cool. Does it really? I have no idea. The deep skirt makes for a nice flat pan rail and makes sealing the oil pan easy. So there is that. After getting the pan, the oil pump, and the necessary plumbing bolted down tight, he applies a little assembly grease to the oil pump rotors just to help the oiling system prime up more quickly. Modern multi-layer steel head gaskets will help contain the combustion gases between the head and the cylinder bore. For the Y block, there is a left and a right head gasket because you have to line up the hole in the gasket with the oil gallery that feeds the oil to the rocker stands. Here's a look at the stock cast iron cylinder head. The intake valves are new originals from Ford and are sized at 1 inch 780 thousandths. The exhausts were sourced from SBI and are 1 inch 513 thousandths in diameter. The combustion chambers are a semi-open design and pretty deep. They aren't as efficient as a modern shallow heart shaped chamber, but it's not the worst design in the world either. Chamber size is approximately 69 cc's and the compression ratio is just slightly over 8 to 1. The cylinder heads only use 10 head bolts each to secure the head to the block. They are torqued down to 70 pounds each. With the stock camshaft, we won't need too much spring pressure to maintain valve control. These are SBI single springs with about 80 pounds on the seat. They're secured with steel retainers and single groove locks. And now we get to the unique feature of the cylinder head. Remember, this is Ford's first V8 overhead valve engine. And for some reason, they decided to stack the intake ports on top of each other. This makes for some interesting intake port designs with the top pair of runners obviously longer than the lower pair. It makes it practically impossible to get equal flow numbers through the ports, so you just have to accept the compromise and make the most of it. The exhaust ports, however, have a, ah, how shall we say this, very Chevy small block style layout. After a quick coat of paint, Dorton was able to start bolting up the accessories. And notice the big fuel pump. It has different names, but most people call it a double decker pump. The bottom half is a conventional diaphragm style fuel pump, but it also activates a vacuum pump up top which is used to power the windshield wipers. Pretty trick for 50s technology. One place where we are varying the purely stock trend is with the intake manifold. This is a cast aluminum dual plane intake from John Mummert machine. Besides cutting significant weight versus a stock cast iron version, the Mummert intake does a good job of improving the flow characteristics mostly by raising the roof of the runners while still managing to fit underneath the stock Thunderbird hood. Plus, it's also machined to accept a Holley four barrel carburetor without any adapter plates. And just for reference, here's the original cast iron version. It looks mostly the same, but notice how the roofs of the runners are lower. That makes for a tighter turn to get from the intake runners to the combustion chambers. 
In some Y block builds, Dorton has come up with a system to use modern high strength push rods. But for this build, we're sticking with the original style push rods with cups that mate to the rocker arms. These are 8 inches 300 thousandths long and 312 thousandths in diameter. The rocker arms are shaft mounted and the oil flows up from the rocker stands into and through the shaft to lubricate the rockers. Dorton also modifies the setup here to improve oil flow to all the rockers. These are the new rocker shafts for the Y block we're doing. And if you notice, well, the oil comes in from the block right here. And we talked about early, earlier about how we got the oil here with auxiliary oiling in the valley. Well, the oil comes in here and it's distributed each rock arm. This hole is a bypass hole that this tube goes in. And why, why you need that, I'm not sure. So we're going to eliminate it. The way we're doing that is I've tapped this rocker stand for a set screw and I'm just going to put the Loctite on it and run it right into that hole and that blocks it up. So we've got our stand locked down. Now we're going to get all the oil to the rock arms itself. The rockers and stands must be assembled on the shafts before anything is bolted up to the cylinder heads. If you aren't careful, the rocker arms won't center up over the valve stems, so shims are used to ensure that the rockers are directly over each valve. The lash is set to 19 thousandths cold. Some people like to set the lash a little tighter because they found it helps cut down on valve train noise when the engine is running. Dorton also marks each of the push rods with a yellow paint pen. Remember, this is a solid lifter valve train, so if the lifters and push rods don't spin, that's the sign of a flattened cam lobe. So the mark on each push rod lets you go back and check to see if the push rod is rotated. After a quick points rebuild, the distributor is ready to go back in. Notice the large boss on the housing just underneath the vacuum advance canister. That's the hookup for the mechanical tack wire. And finally, we have the iconic Thunderbird valve covers. The Y block uses just two bolts to secure the valve covers to the top of the head, and the gasket rail on the cylinder head is as cast and not machine flat. So a good sturdy valve cover is often the best way to ensure you don't wind up with any annoying oil leaks. Now it's time to head to the dyno and see what this Y block can do. Once in the car, the modern carburetor will be hidden underneath the air cleaner and barely visible. How did it do? Not too bad considering this engine was first drawn up back in the early 50s. With so many original parts and cast pistons, Dorton didn't want to push it too hard, so we only ran it up to 4800 RPM. But by then we'd already seen peak power, which was 289.7 pound-feet of torque at 3300 RPM and 218 horsepower at 4500. That's not exactly going to set the world on fire by modern engine standards. But remember, we're talking about the engine that replaced Ford's flathead all the way back in 1954. But don't be confused, this build isn't about power. This is about keeping a classic engine, a true piece of automotive history as a matter of fact, alive and putting miles on the road for years to come. Mission success. God bless America. <laughs>